The number one seed against the number eight seed. Duke, because they were number one, had a bye through the first round. So they've had seven days off. Clemson, meanwhile, just three days to recover from their first round win at home this past Wednesday over number nine, Notre Dame. They got that 3-1 win. So rest for the Blue Devils, but an informed Clemson team. How much does it matter that Duke was off this last week and Clemson had to play to get here to the quarterfinals, Michael? Knowing the Clemson Tigers, knowing how fit they are, they're a team that relies a lot on substitutions in how they play, a team that loves to press, a team that loves to possess. It's going to matter how they start this game more than anything. And here comes Duke early on into the final third. A Duke squad that has been more known, especially late in the season, for their defensive capabilities. This is a team that is number one in the nation defensively this season, and they have not allowed a goal in their last six games. That's how robust they've been on the back line. They've scored 26 goals as a team on the year, allowed only five. But the last time they conceded a goal was way back on October the 1st when they played at then number one Wake Forest gave up two goals but still beat the number one ranked Demon Deacons on the road that night. When I see those stats and you have a resolute defense like Duke does, that tells you that they are tournament ready, not just conference tournament, but potentially NCAA tournament ready. Last time that Duke played was right here at Koskinen Stadium last Friday as they beat Virginia Tech in their regular season finale. They've won three of four coming in. While Clemson got the win in the first round of this ACC tournament on Wednesday at home over Notre Dame. They've won three in a row, and that matches their largest winning streak of the season. It's a team that really has had a rocky up-and-down year because of so many issues that have hit this Clemson Tigers squad. They've had COVID, they've had injuries, and inconsistent form as a result. Believe it or not, this is their 18th game and their 18th different starting lineup they've gone with on the pitch at the beginning of a game. This is a Clemson team that's also lost a bunch of starters from the national championship team, a younger version of Clemson soccer. They still have some potent attackers and key pieces down the spine of the team that can hurt you at any given time. And despite the inconsistencies, the troubling thing for Duke will be the fact that Clemson is really starting to find their form, get in their flow, and hit their stride at just the right time. We talked with head coach Mike Noonan a couple of days ago, and we asked him how close are they to being at what they considered to be their best. And he said, pretty close. We're just about there. So this is a team with so much offensive talent. Again, defending national champions and a lot of that offensive talent back this year. And now everyone rounding into form at just the right time. And rounding into health, I think of Isaiah Reed, a key component of that national championship run, scored both goals in the final against Washington. He will have to be at his best if Clemson are to get anything out of this postseason run. What's important to watch for early in this one, do you think, Michael? It's going to be down to how they deal with Duke's press. Duke, yes, they're good on the ball. They can hit you on the counter. They're better without the ball because they will set pressing traps. If you overplay in your own end, they will punish you on the counterattack. This is the first time they have met this season. Did not play in the regular season. The last actual meeting between the two teams was in this very same ACC tournament in the semifinal round a year ago. Duke won on the road at Clemson. And that was the final loss of the year for the Tigers, who then went on that sensational run all the way to the NCAA title. Chance for the Tigers here, building into the final third, attacking from the left. Hamill comes out, and a great save off the line. Scramble still on the line. Appeal for handball, none given. And terrific defense off the line. Two different defenders helping clear. Mike Noonan incensed. He thought there was a handball defensively there as Hamill was kind of caught out of position, but his defenders picked up the slack to keep the ball out of the net. This is going to be a close call. Keep an eye on Isaiah Reed. That center step sets up Usman Silla. Looking at this again, I think that's a handball. The defender's on the ground. You're impeding the goal, a potential goal, with your hand. He knows exactly what he's doing. When he hits there, look at that left hand. When your arm is outstretched like that, 
Some might say an inverted contact. I say that's a handball. Missed call from the referee. The Blue Devils get away with that one. Well, it was Axel Gudbjornsson, the freshman from Iceland, who was down on the turf and on the goal line. Now, what's interesting about that, the ball hit underneath his leg first, and then caromed off his leg, hit his arm, which was basically keeping his balance. So given that, do you still call for handball in that instance, Michael? Given what happens in this modern day where now I feel like you don't know what the handball is, in my book, whenever a defender is using any part of his body other than his legs, any part of his body that's connected to his arm, that's a handball. If he's not there, if his arm doesn't touch that, then that's a goal. And I think the referee, it's a game of details, it's a game of inches. I think he got that one wrong. Yeah, you look at that angle, and it clearly prevents the goal. And even though he didn't move his arm to try and block the ball, it was in a position where I think you probably do give the handball. The question I have, there were so many bodies and legs in that pile there. Did he have a good, clear view of it? No, it, it, you clearly see it. The referee, I think he makes the safest call, which is if there's no, if there's any indecision, you just go with the safety route. And he didn't feel as confident in that. That's why in the modern game, they're introducing video review. And I can see in that play, that may have helped. But this is college soccer. We don't have that yet. So a huge break for the Blue Devils here in the early going. Steve, keep an eye on that moment there. Clemson players coming over to have a word with the referee. You typically see referees, once they realize if they missed a call, they will give a makeup call at some point in this game. And here's a call in favor of Clemson that is going to give them a set piece from inside the Duke end as Usman Silla, the junior from Senegal, is taken down. Silla is going to be crucial to Clemson's success, and that's a clear foul. Silla's got a low center of gravity inviting the contact and sets up a free kick opportunity. Looked like a linebacker taking down a running back. I mean, he just grabbed him and brought him down. Pretty easy decision watching, that time. <laughs> they've been watching some of the ACC college football games from the weekend, getting some motivation. Hoping they didn't watch the Clemson football game last night. Tigers trying to forget that loss on the road at Notre Dame. As this one is floated in over the top right to Elliott Hamill, who's been terrific in goal for Duke this season. One of the top keepers in the nation statistically. His defenders helped them out a few moments ago, though, to keep this a scoreless game. What I love that Hamill did to prevent the initial shot from Silly, he comes off his line, he's aggressive off his line, he makes himself big, and it forces that second shot. If he doesn't make that first block, then you're looking at 1-0 Clemson with an early lead. Now we can see just how dangerous Clemson is going forward. They have that pace, that physicality, that quickness on and off the ball, and the technical skill as well. And Duke just trying to settle in here. Headed over the top. Scotty Taylor running onto it. And he's going to get whistled for the foul here. Taylor had the only goal in Duke's most recent game, the 1-0 win in the season finale over Virginia Tech. With Taylor being included in today's starting lineup, that's down to the coach rewarding the striker who's filled in admirably for... The sometimes available, sometimes not, Jai Bean. It's a big call to start him in this game, though, with Bean having been healthy. Hamill has to come out to smother this. Elliot Hamill, the grad student from Scarsdale, New York, has played every minute of the season in goal for Duke. Had a great game last year against Clemson. And this season, he's been even better. Here's Shaq Mohammed. Has a couple of defenders on him. Switches the field. Amir Daly cutting back in. And he's run off the ball. That doesn't happen often. But now the Tigers in space. It's excellent defending. I think that's Peter Stroud. He knows that if he goes into a physical battle with Silla, he might lose out. But the angle he takes to cut off Silla, who's waiting to invite contact, is what gives him the advantage on that play. And the whistle is going to be against Brandon Parrish, the junior from Nashville here. And he's going to be assessed the first card of the game. Says, I got him with my shoulder, but I think he went in a little too ambitiously for the liking of our referee, Kevin Morrison. 
In the game of this magnitude, both these teams are going to remember last year's game, how heated it was. Peter Stroud checking in, and yeah, that's it's a bit more than shoulder to shoulder on that play. Parrish using, let's say, his hip to check Stroud out of bounds. Kind of wound up on that one. Parrish, a Gatorade Player of the Year at high school in Tennessee, a high school All-American as well. A guy that head coach Mike Noonan says one of his best box-to-box -box players. So good defensively, very physical, as we just saw there a moment ago. Coming up on the 10-minute mark in a scoreless first half. Final of four quarterfinal round games in the ACC tournament here today. Number one against number eight to finish off the day. And a lot of players getting heated here early. Scotty Taylor going up. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He was never going to win that header, but undercuts the opposing defender. And both these teams are going to go for it. Diop misjudges that, but Taylor not even going up fairly. And that's surprise the referee. I think because he just gave a yellow card before, I'm surprised he didn't reach for his back pocket, but might have given Taylor a warning. Clemson, relatively fearless here in the early going, but that should be no surprise. They have been terrific on the road this season. In fact, statistically, they've been a better road team than a home team here this year. They've only lost once away from historic Riggs Field this year. They've lost four times at home, but they've really buttoned things up when they've gone on the road. And when you're on the road, you become road warriors. Coach Mike Newton was talking about that. There's more of a relaxed field, and he credits some of the new faces in giving that more relaxed environment, team environment. He said that this is a group that enjoys being together. And when you're on the road, you have no choice but to be in the bunker together and get something to make yourself proud. Boy, every player acting as if every call is an overtime major decision. Pleading their case, getting very animated. Watch Shaq Muhammad here. And Shaq Muhammad's going to be getting fouled all night. <laughs> He's furious that, that wasn't a referee. Hamid Diop not really making an effort to play the ball. He dives in early. Muhammad having the, sk the skill to spin him and draw the foul. you got to appreciate the theatrics. <laughs> Any way to work the official. I feel like the theatrics go up just a notch more in ACC tournament play. Here's Mohamed dropping deep to get on the ball. Has some space to run. A lot of orange shirts getting back behind the ball now. Antino Lopez against two defenders will reset. Peter Stroud, a guy who will probably cover more of this field than anybody here tonight. You'll see him all over the pitch, left, right, and center. Check the mileage and the odometer at the end of every match, and he's usually ahead by miles on everyone else. Amir Daly on a good cross field switch. And a heavy touch, a defender got in his way, and just couldn't get it right. It's better set up from the Duke Blue Devils. They've tried to go down the middle of the field. Clemson bringing in a lot of numbers in. Thought Daly had an excellent game in their last match. Against Virginia Tech, really stepped up in the second half. Look for his slashing runs, taking high starting positions on this right side as a right wing back. That's a heavy challenge. And Stroud wants a card. Again, Brandon Parrish involved here. Well, he already has a yellow, so they're not going to give yeah. him a second yellow and toss him this early. <laughs> oh, well, he has to be very careful. Uh, I know you want to make a statement tackle. Clemson prides himself on that defensive transition work, but you're no good to your team if you go and get a silly second yellow card this early in the match. Clemson getting numbers in the box, and they'll get the game's first corner here. Always interesting, though, because 
you can kind of take your chances if you're feeling frisky with an official early in a game. If you know you get an early caution and maybe have another heavy challenge in the early going, daring him almost <laughs> to try and give you a second yellow, feeling he probably won't. But again, live by the sword, die by the sword. You're, you're playing with fire, so never an easy decision. But Parrish, who got away with one a moment ago, now will take the corner here. In swinger for the Tigers. Gets a lot underneath this one. And as a result, it sails over the top of everyone and out for a Duke throw. Keep an eye on that late runner. Clemson, a good set piece team. Parrish floats that ball and doesn't really aim for anyone. I think he was more aiming for that far post area. Clemson showing some offensive flair here in the early going. They have three goals in each of their last three games. Prior to that, they only had five goals over a six-game stretch. So again, a lot starting to come together. The pieces falling in place for Mike Noonan's squad here. Looking for their fourth consecutive win after having lost three in a row. And before that, they essentially alternated wins and losses over a five-game span. That's an illustration of the type of up-and-down season they have had. But right now, certainly the trajectory is up. And they're at their best form that they've had all season. And the perfect time for it as they look to advance to yet another ACC tournament semifinal. If they can get by Duke here, it would be their 11th in the last 12 years. During this three-game run, something that's caught my eye is how many goals they've stopped leaking. In the first part of the season, they could score goals, but they were giving up goals, silly goals, and soft goals, in my opinion. Now they've gotten back to that defensive solidarity, and it helps when you have some of your key players healthy and in form. Yeah, Mike Noonan said that he was irritated with some of those soft goals they were given up in the middle of the season, but that commitment, that recalibration to defend with intensity, with passion, they got back to that, now pairing that with offensive capabilities like this. And this is a team that's not going to be an easy out. One thing you can be assured of when you play against the Duke Blue Devils is you have to compete. If you don't compete, they'll play you off the park. Duke prides themselves on that. And it's good to see Clemson getting back to what makes them special. They do have good attackers, but those attackers do defend on both sides of the ball. And that was a key ingredient for their national championship run last year. So last year, Duke handed Clemson their last loss of the season before the Tigers went on to win the national title. Duke, meanwhile, themselves have not lost since the NCAA tournament last year. They were beaten by St. Louis in the tournament a year ago. But since then, they have not suffered a defeat. Coming in here, 11 wins, no losses, and four draws overall. Overlapping run. Hamill off his line, and the shot into the side of the netting. That's good play from the Clemson Tigers. They're overloading numbers in the middle of the park. When they play this 4-4-2 diamond, they have more numbers than Duke does. Look at how many players get forward. 4v3 on the counter, and that pass is just overcooked. Hamill again coming off his line to close down the angle. Clemson knocking at the door, though. They've looked good in transition. Been impressed with their commitment to get numbers behind the ball, but also spring on the counter with four or five attackers. That was Derek Wallof, number 16 in orange, the grad student from Madison, Wisconsin. Grad transfer from Brown, where he was an all-Ivy League first-team selection. Led Brown in points. And now playing his final season in Clemson with this Tiger squad. Here's Mohamed Say. Big, fast, physical. Now Silla has three defenders keeping an eye on him. Now Wallace. It's a good combination play attempt from Isaiah Reed. 
Reed, a player who is an out-and-out -out winger, converted to a striker this year. Clemson opting to play a 4-4-2 in this matchup. The one thing he brings is he showed on that early opportunity where Clemson almost scored is his speed playing off of Mohamed Say. Oh, there's a bad giveaway. Now here is Mohamed Say. He's got two players with him. Goes for goal from distance, but misses the mark. Mohamed Say doing what strikers do in this conference is being selfish. Rightfully so, but he had Parrish streaking down the right-hand side unmarked. Duke being a bit careless in possession. And when Say gets his keeping eye on Parrish, nobody on him streaking, screaming at him, screaming his name. I'd like to see him have a bit more vision. Mohamed Say, the senior from Valencia, Spain, who's dealt with a lot of injuries over the course of the last few seasons, but the only player to start every game this season as he has been fully healthy for Clemson, and as a result, leads this team in assists and had a goal in the 3-1 win over Notre Dame in the middle of the week. How he goes, this Clemson attack, a large part of it, will go such a key cog in how they build up. So far in this game, they've bypassed Duke's press, opting to go for long balls. His physical presence up top, his ability to hold the ball up against this physical Duke defense will invite the likes of Isaiah Reed and Usman Silla to make runs underneath and beyond. Clemson with the early edge in shots, 6-0 over Duke. And here's Say again. Playing it into space. Now Say had it caught behind his back foot. And speaking of the back foot, that's kind of where Duke has been stuck here. Midway through this first half, looking for their first shot. What's the key for them to start generating some offensive chances, do you think, Michael? It's right on cue. It's getting the ball quicker from side to side. Clemson, they're cutting off entry passes into Shaq Muhammad, which is a big part of how Duke play. Getting your outside backs up and getting that ball with diagonals into Daly and even Macias, who we haven't called his name as much. In the last couple weeks, Macias has been one of the unsung heroes of this team. When they get both their wing backs up, good things happen. They can overload the box with numbers, but they've been stuck playing short passes and not picking their head up and hitting longer diagonals. There is Ruben Masalas, the sophomore from Sarasota, Florida, an all ACC freshman player. First team, all ACC a year ago. Twenty-three minutes left to go here in the first frame. Masalas brings it down nicely. Goes one v one. Now Nick Periano, who's good on crosses like this, but it's headed away. Top of the box, Peter Stroud, and his shot is blocked. And out for Duke's first corner of the game. It's much better from the Blue Devils. More balance to their attack. Right on cue. Masalas getting high. And that allows Periano to tuck in more to pick up second balls. Periano can hit crosses with either foot. That's why he's leading the team in assists. And Peter Stroud doing well to collect the second ball. Stroud boasts a venomous long-distance shot. Good block for Clemson. Now Periano, the junior from Philadelphia, leading this team in assists this season. He was top five in the conference a year ago in the same category. So good on set pieces. But instead, it's the in-swinger that's knocked down by Joseph Andema, the freshman from Ghana, who gets really his first touch of the game here. As he's brought into the match, a guy with an 8-3-1 and three and one record, has allowed eight goals, has six shutouts on the year in goal. For Duke, you want to take advantage of that when you get the ball in wide areas. I've played against many freshman goalkeepers during my time at Wake Forest. And one thing that we stressed was get shots on goal, test them early, see where his nerves are at. On that play, he didn't come and collect cleanly. If you're Duke, next set piece, get a body on him, be physical, and see if you can nudge him, unbalance him, and maybe get a corner kick or free kick goal. One of the issues for Duke is this is a team that is used to having a lot of time on the ball, having possession, 
protracted spells in possession as well. When you don't have that in a game like this, with the stakes this high, how do you respond? You do it with the defensive work, maybe getting a big tackle on one of your big players from the opposing team. Mohamed Say, Usman Silla, and hitting in transition. This is a Duke team that doesn't have just one way of playing. Yes, plan A is to possess, outpossess you, outpass you, but plan B, they are just gifted in playing in close games. They will have no problem if this game ends 1-0. They'll celebrate that. The biggest focal point of theirs is maintaining a zero and being good and solid defensively. Think about this. Duke has played in 10 games this season, decided by a goal or less, and they haven't lost a single one. First undefeated regular season since 1999, and the first ACC team to go through conference play unbeaten since Wake Forest five years ago. So they've been in a lot of close games, unfazed. They find a way through. So that experience should certainly come into play at some point here as they get deeper into the postseason. As Alvaro Gomez is the game's first sub, the senior from Spain checks in. And Brandon Parrish, who's sitting on a yellow, is the man to make way. Reed pulls it back from the end line. This is what's made Clemson difficult to play against. If you're Duke, Duke waiting for Clemson to maybe thread the needle, force a pass. But Clemson's done a good job of playing what they see and getting out of tight spaces. But here we go, counterattack. South of 20 minutes left to go in a very sprightly first half. Every time Shaq Muhammad gets the ball, three or four Clemson players collapsing on him, not giving him any space to breathe. That's going to be an interesting matchup for him to start figuring out where to operate. When you're an attacking player, attacking midfielder, maybe the middle of the park is not where you're going to get a lot of your chances. That means wide spaces drifting into the channels. Can Peter Stroud, can Hot find you? Can some of your ball-playing center backs find you in those wide channels? Now you're running 1v1 or 2v1 with an overlapping outside back. And the first Duke yellow card issued to Peter Stroud, the junior from Chester, New Jersey, the ACC midfielder of the year a season ago. Stroud reads this, and it's that bit of hesitation. He goes to ground early. I think he could have gotten there if he kept his feet moving. The referee judging that to be a yellow card. Third team All-American last year. Has the most starts of any player on this Duke team. Over 50 for his career. He reminds me a lot of a guy I played with at Wake Forest University, Sam Cronin. He was our captain when we won the national championship. And just Mr. Consistent. When you see a player starting games and starting week in and week out, game in and game out, that means that he has the trust and responsibility of the coach. And Peter Stroud, love watching him play. I think he's a complete midfielder in college soccer. Now the college basketball season tips off tomorrow and we have you covered with ACC PM in Chapel Hill from 3 to 5 Eastern to get you set for the night. A series of games coming up. You've got Louisville taking on Cincinnati. The Blue Devils hosting Jacksonville. The Tar Heels playing host to UNC Wilmington. And then the nothing but net crew wrapping things up from Chapel Hill at the end of the night. Tipping off the season here on the ACC Network and the ESPN app. And that last play, Lundegaard getting caught on the ball. Shaq Muhammad is a tireless worker, does well to back press and bait that turnover. If you don't know what to do as a defender, get the ball forward. You have a target striker in your team. No need to take extra chances. So three cards here in this first half, two to Clemson, one for Duke. Just inside of 18 minutes left to go before the break. First free kick for Duke from a long way out, but a chance to get runners in the box. And it will be Periano who swings it in. Now Ruben Masalas going backwards. Yeah, 
Now Joseph Andema, again the freshman from Ghana who was platooning early in the season but then won the starting job outright. Has made 11 consecutive starts now here at the end of the season and coming off a career-high six saves in the first round win over Notre Dame this past Wednesday. So along with the rest of the team, really finding his rhythm at just the right time of the year. Bodies hitting the deck, no call here. And given the fact that he's gotten a couple shutouts towards the end of the season, that will boost the confidence in his young career. Hasn't really been tested though so far by Duke. This is a Blue Devil team that took 43 shots over its previous three games coming in, but has just one shot tonight. And we're down to inside of 17 minutes remaining in the first half. And for Duke, they're getting the ball in dangerous areas. We haven't seen anyone take a long distance shot. When you're playing against a low block team, a team that's going to absorb pressure like Clemson has in their own end, getting a shot from deep is going to make them respect you. And I look at Peter Stroud to maybe be the one to unlock this Clemson team with a strike from deep. This Duke team does like to attack from the wings, get crosses in the box, but they haven't really had that opportunity so far here tonight. Again, Shaq Mohammed finds his way onto the ball. Has Periano making the run, but instead tries to settle things down. I think that's a good decision from Muhammad, recognizing that he was running out of, out of real estate. Clemson shifting players, two players at a time, marshalling him, one to put pressure on him, the other to cover, changing the point of attack. And that right side is wide open. Clemson playing narrow with this diamond. It's going to leave spaces for both outside backs to play high. Duke enjoying its best stretch on the ball here. It's a miscommunication. Taylor tried to flip it through for Mohammed, who did not make the run. And if Taylor had taken a look over his shoulder, he had a 2v1, had both defenders caught flat and taken up a brilliant position between both center backs. When you have a second striker like Mohammed, having a center forward that plays between the lines, plays between both center backs, is going to be massive because it gives you a focal point to play off of. A quarter of an hour left to go in a scoreless first half. Number one Duke, number eight Clemson. Final of four quarterfinal round games in the ACC tournament here on this early November Sunday. Koskinen Stadium in Durham, North Carolina. And the home team looking to strike first. Peter Stroud with daylight. Drops it for Mohammed. And Shaq Mohammed maybe his best chance of the game. Shooting from outside the box, but off the mark. Much better from the Blue Devils, more dynamic attack, and it's Peter Stroud, runs from midfield, is another echelon of this attack. He accelerates him, but he always has his head up, watching and looking for the run of Muhammad. And I think Muhammad rushes that shot, a bit over-eager to get into the final third. But I like that. One-touch passing, dynamic play, and the Blue Devils looking to spark their attack. Shaq Mohammed. Todd for the most points in the ACC this season, leading this Duke team in both goals and points. Was on the ACC All-Tournament team a year ago. And now Wayne Frederick coming in for Duke, a mere daily checking out. Luke Thomas also replacing Periano as the Blue Devils make a few substitutions here. Marco Garcia seeing his first action for Clemson with Mohamed Say getting his first break of the night. Starting to feel like Duke is growing into the game a little more. They weathered that early offensive test by the Tigers. Maybe got a break with a no call on a handball with the defender on the goal line. But now Duke growing in confidence, it appears. Spending more time on the ball and settling in to a nice little rhythm here in the final 13 minutes of this first half. Chance for Clemson here from the top of the box. Silla has to go backwards with it. Usman Silla here, cuts it back once again. Look at all the blue shirts in the box. Reed, nowhere to go. So Clemson will wait. 
And credit to Duke. That's just good defending. When Usman Silla gets the ball at the top of the box, he's very much right-footed, a player much like Shaq Muhammad that wants to eventually cut to his right foot to get a shot off. Good recognition of a player's strengths and your opponent's strength. Silla, when he gets to that top of the box, he does boast an accurate long-distance shot. Duke doing well to get everyone behind the ball and force an errant pass from the Tigers. This Duke squad, top team in the country defensively, having only allowed five goals this entire season and none in the last six games. Now almost six and a half as we're down under 12 minutes left to go in the first half. What's that saying about uh, defense wins, what, is that the C word, championships? If you boast a good oh, defense. Glad, yeah, you, yeah. It <laughs> is championships. Week. Yeah, that's the one. So do you want me to ask their team to move back? This is a team, though, that would probably like to generate a little more offense than they have over the last few games, however. Only three goals in their last four conference games coming in. Here is Frederick. Lofting this one in. And a wide open header, but right to Endema. Couldn't get a lot behind that. But the first cross that really provided a dangerous opportunity in the box for this Duke team. And Duke doing well to hit diagonals. And when this ball comes in, oh, he's going to want that one back. Don't think he recognized how much time and space he had on that play. More composure was needed. Maybe bring that down, take a look at where the goalkeeper was because Endemo was not coming off his line. He was rooted to his line on that cross. And what might have been. Silla, who's worked both sides of the front line here in this first half for Clemson. Move your feet, move your feet, keep moving. Go, 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 go. Enrique Montana crosses in and just blasted into the air with slightly north of 10 minutes remaining here in this first half. With 10 minutes left, Clemson starting to introduce some of their key starters and usual suspects. I think of Alvaro Gomez and Montana as well. Montana had the assist on the Mohamed Say goal, third goal for the Tigers to get them to this game. Well, ACC PM with Mark Packer, Trey Boston, and Taylor Tannenbaum will always be talking football, and we'll also have the latest from around the conference on ACCN PM. That's weekdays at 4 Eastern right here on the ACC Network and the ESPN app. Three games so far today in the tournament. Three one nothing wins, all for the better seeds. First, it was number four, Wake Forest, beating Virginia Tech. Then number three, Virginia over Pitt, followed by number two, Syracuse, in the most recent game, winning at home over North Carolina. So not a lot of scoring, not much offense. Still no scoring here tonight. But the top seeds advancing so far to the semifinal round. And Duke trying to join him as the number one seed here tonight in this primetime matchup with number eight, Clemson. I think it's down to the fact that the away teams going to play against these top four teams, they are very competitive and very good away sides this season. They're going to fight you to the final whistle, and it's proven that way. It just shows the importance of getting that first goal. Both these two teams have amazing records when they score first. Whichever team blinks, We'll give up that goal. Jai Bean now coming in for Shaq Mohammed. Biggest change that Duke has made, being the sophomore from Bermuda, has three goals this season, has been bothered by an ankle injury, however. And that goes back to last year. He missed five weeks of his freshman year as he was injured, but a tremendous offensive talent was high school player of the year in the New England area growing up and also a member of Bermuda's under 20 national team so Mohammed may come out but Bean certainly can fill his shoes offensively now coming in for the first time tonight for the Blue Devils up top with and Bean coming in Clemson here 
with Bean coming in, look for them to have more speed up top. Jai Bean, very pacey player, wants to constantly test that back line. Look for him to make runs off the shoulders of the two Clemson center backs. That's Antino Lopez, number five, who is down. This game has been known to be chippy. Clemson, no strangers to tough tackles. And that was a good yellow card shout. We saw Paris get one in the first half for a similar challenge. Lopez feeling every brunt of that late challenge from the Tigers. Lopez, one of the top defensive players on this Duke squad. Very reliable. He gets a lot of minutes. Not very injury prone. Jai Bean beaten here on the back line by Adam Lundegaard. And now could be a 2v1 for the Tigers. Silla plays it ahead. And the flag is up. Offsides, first of the game on Clemson. Marco Garcia, the freshman from Italy, coming off the bench. Would have been in alone, but just didn't check his run. And that's going to be close. I thought that was inches away from a potential onside call, but a bit over eager from Garcia. Usman Silla maybe played that half a second earlier. Garcia making the good angled run, creating the angle and the passing lane to invite that Silla pass. But Clemson showing how dangerous they can be, how dangerous they have been. Another tough tackle from the Tigers. Potential yellow card defense. And that does indeed look like it's going to be a yellow against Derek Wolof, a grad student from Madison. Third yellow on the visitors. Yeah, I think head coach Mike Noonan has talked to his team. Duke, a very good transition team of saying, when they get half a yard in front of you, take the early foul, foul at midfield. Don't let them get ahead of steam, because when they do, they're incredibly dangerous on the counter. So just under half a dozen minutes left to go. And a Clemson player down here. So they stop the clock to issue the yellow. And it's Hamadi Diop, the defender, who is down. Boy, Diop, huge part of this Clemson back line. The junior from Senegal, ACC, all second team a year ago, freshman team the year before. And a goal against the Blue Devils in their meeting last year. And the type of guy you don't want to lose in a tournament like this. And with a lot of the graduated players, as we see here, going to the pros, I think of his partnership with Oscar Argren. Last year, Argren such a leader for this team, leading them to that national championship. George Marks as well, who plies his trade for Charlotte FC. Diop has now established himself as the leader of this back line, but has struggled to stay fit this season. Yeah, all kinds of different injuries this year. He's been in and out of the lineup. Originally came over from Senegal, went to the prestigious Montverde Academy. And has been a big contributor and a decorated player since the moment he stepped on campus at Clemson. Well, an opportunity for both teams, though, to kind of catch their breath here for the final six minutes of this first half. As we get a moment here, take the temperature of what you've seen so far in this first frame, Michael. Uh, what has stuck out to you and what changes might you think the coaches could be considering as they look towards halftime? I think Clemson had the better of the first 15, 20 minutes. Their commitment to play, their commitment to keep the ball away from Duke, frustrated Duke. Duke didn't know what to really do. They struggled to find Shaq Muhammad in pockets. But I think a lot of that's changed now that they've gotten both outside backs forward, getting Peter Stroud in more attacking midfield position. We saw that on a golden opportunity that Shaq Muhammad had, his first clear side on goal. It came from deep lying running from midfield from Stroud. Look for more of that in the second half and late on in this first half. 
Now Duke has certainly grabbed a foothold in this game after absorbing a lot of pressure from Clemson early. In the first 20 minutes or so, Clemson outshot the Blue Devils 6-0. But in the last 20, it's been Duke 4-0 in terms of shots on goal over the Tigers. But Clemson still looking dangerous at times. And when they've picked up possession in the middle of the pitch, they've been able to get forward in a hurry, get numbers into the final third, and have looked dangerous, just haven't had the end product. And I've been impressed with their commitment to get numbers forward in transition. All their attacks have come through the dynamic play of Usman Silla. When he gets in the final third, if you keep giving him these counterattack opportunities, he will take advantage of one of them. And now you find yourself down 1 0. We have one. We have one. Duke just clearing that one, but trying to turn it into an offensive chance. Jai Bean leaving it for Luke Thomas. It's the second time this half we've seen Lundegaard struggle with running back to his goal, letting that ball bounce. Remember, my head coach, Jay Vinovich, used to call that a cardinal sin in soccer when you are a defender and you are playing facing your own goal. You never let that ball bounce. Get that ball cleared out of bounds. Get your team to get their line back. That is taking a massive chance late on in this half because you have tired legs, you have tired minds, you've put in a shift. You don't want to let one bad bounce spring Duke on a breakaway chance. All right, this is the first quarter from this side for the Blue Devils. Miguel Ramirez, the junior from Georgia. Plays it to the back of the six-yard box, straight up into the air, and Dama knocks it down. And the foul is called against Duke with just over three minutes to go. Dama doing enough to warrant that foul, telling the referee that he was getting elbowed. In the modern game, you're going to see the goalkeeper getting the benefit of the doubt, getting more protection than you would maybe a decade ago or going further back. Very athletic player, good with his feet. The only knock on him is that sometimes he's a little over anxious, maybe too aggressive, but still developing as a freshman, has a very high soccer IQ. At one point was a striker before he came to the college game, but transferred to the keeper position. Basically said he just didn't like to run that much. So <laughs> that's a good spot, I guess, then. Oh, man, I wish I would have figured that part out when I played. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rest of us are just too dumb <laughs> to realize it. And a set piece here for Duke, which is over two minutes to go. Kerr doing well to get his body between the ball and the man. And Clemson, they've had some tackles where I just scratched my head where these foul counts are going to keep going up. And if you keep doing that in the second half, the yellow car count is going to go up. You leave the referee no choice. The Tigers have to be careful because not only do you get a potential yellow card, you start giving away dangerous set-piece opportunities like this. All right, so Ruben Masalas and Miguel Ramirez both standing over this one with a minute and a half to go in this first half of play. Masalas, the left footer. Ramirez, the right Mark foot. Up. Typically, it would be Masalas in this situation. No, it didn't work out. And that's going to drive Coach Kerr crazy. I know trick plays are something you work on on the training ground, but with a minute left in the half, get the ball in the box. A bit of miscommunication. Masalas opening up his body, looking at him, wanting that ball to be put into his running path. Ramirez with the miscue, playing that ball too hard, overcooking it, letting Clemson off the hook. Sometimes you just overthink things, don't you? Oh, yeah. You could basically oh, yeah. get the same you get the same service from a stationary set piece <laughs> as you would if Miss Ellis was running onto that one. Uh, less is more. Less is more yeah. big games. Go, go, go. 
final half minute. Clemson looking to create one more chance here in the final third. Lopez for Duke trying to clear. And that sends out for a goal kick. And Elliot Hamill, the keeper for Duke, not happy. He's out very vocal with his defenders. Tremendous leader, the grad student. And now as the clock expires, there's a Duke player down on the far side. I believe that is Antino Lopez. So the semifinal round, Wake Forest the number four seed. So if Clemson gets the win, Wake would host in Winston-Salem. Meantime, if Duke gets the victory, then the Demon Deacons will come here to Koskinen Stadium in Durham. The other semi already set. Virginia taking on Syracuse up in the Northeast. So just one more slot to fill in the final four bracket here in the ACC tournament. And Michael, as we alluded to, kind of two different phases of that first half. The first portion dominated by Clemson, a lot of offensive chances, and then Duke growing into the game later on. The final 20 minutes belonged to them offensively as they started to put things together in the final third. So what does that portend for this second half? How do you see things developing here coming out of the locker room? I see a trend of more of the same. Clemson, they have that big game experience. I think of the likes of Mohamed Say, Isaiah Reed, Usman Silla being part of that national championship team. They almost came in here with the audacity that we're going to play you off the park. We're not going to be faced by it. And I think this Blue, Blue, Duke Blue Devil team, excuse me, I got Jolly Ranchers in my mouth saying it. This Duke Blue Devil team, they're starting to settle in a bit. I think some of the nerves, the weight of being the number one seed coming into this conference tournament was weighing on them. Now they're getting back to playing more calm, more confident Blue Devil soccer. They've had to wait a long time to play, too, if you think about it, because of the first round by, given the fact that they're the number one seed. They haven't played in over a week's time. And then the final game of the day here at 8 p.m. local time. So they've been sitting around waiting for this game for quite a while. Flag is up here. This is offsides. Second time in this game against Clemson. When well, you're the team that had the short rest, your body gets up for it. The adrenaline that goes into a game like this of this magnitude, you're playing the number one team, you're motivated by going in and being the party spoilers. Keep an eye on the fatigue factor as this second half keeps going on and ticking on for Clemson. The longer it's nil-nil, the more that favors the Duke Blue Devils. While Duke was off, Clemson was playing this past Wednesday in the first round, beating Notre Dame at home, and then making the four-hour drive northeast up I-85 to here in Durham for tonight's game here on this Sunday evening. These teams always seem to play close games, though. This is the seventh all-time meeting in the ACC tournament between the sides. And Clemson has won three, lost two. They tied one on in regulation and through overtime, and it was decided in penalty kicks. And all but one game has been decided by one goal or in PKs. So all six games, very tight ones when these two teams have played in the ACC tournament. If you look at the Duke Blue Devils, how many players were on the field? Quite a few returning players that were on the field last year when they beat Clemson in the ACC semifinals. Those players remember how good that felt and how much better it will feel doing it once more this year. Well, it was the last meeting between these two schools. Remember, they didn't meet in the regular season this year in the ACC semifinals just about a year ago. This time, it was Thor Olofsson who got the only goal of the game. Duke got the win, but it was the last Clemson loss of the year because the Tigers went on that run to win the NCAA championship in the month of December. Now, oh, how about this move by Mohammed? Finally dispossessed, but taking on and beating a lot of defenders along the way. And he's a player who 
when he started coming to life in the first half, Duke really kicked into high gear and looked more dynamic and more dangerous. In that game against Clemson last year, a player who was the star player, in my opinion, was Elliot Hamill. Yes, Thor got the goals, but Hamill, those six saves are so crucial when you're facing a high-powered Clemson offense. And Duke still on this tremendous run defensively. It's now six and a half consecutive games that they've gone without conceding a goal. 13 straight halves, holding their opponents scoreless. Only five goals allowed on the entire season. Elliot Hamill, their keeper, a big reason why. He's played every minute this season. Leads the nation in shutouts with 11. Has the best goals against, as well as save percentage in all of college soccer. And also now fourth place in program history in shutouts for a single season here at Duke as well, given this current run they've been on. When you have a defense like that and a keeper who is hot and experienced like Hamill, that can oftentimes be a formula for a deep postseason run. Absolutely. During our many postseason runs with Wake Forest, we were fortunate to have goalkeepers who not only were good throughout the season, but they stepped up their game that much more this time of the year. You never know when you're going to end up in a game where you're in penalty kicks. You never know when you're not playing well and you need your goalkeeper to step up big. I can guarantee you, you will come across one of those, whether it's in the conference tournament play or in the NCAA tournament. Six minutes gone by, second half. Looking for our first goal. We've only had three through three games to this point in the quarterfinal round here today. Three separate one nothing scores and no score here so far in this nightcap. The game that preceded us, North Carolina at Syracuse, they were scoreless until the final five minutes when the Orange finally got the game winner. If it should stay scoreless, we will go to overtime, and then if necessary, penalty kicks to decide the winner. No overtime in the regular season this year, and a different type of overtime here in the postseason if we get there. It's not golden goal or sudden victory. They will play two 10-minute periods and play them fully all the way through, even if someone scores during the process. And then if it's still tied, then we go to penalty kicks to figure out the winner. I like the rule change from the NCAA. It gives more of a professional feel for both of these schools. And if you're going to make it to extra time, I think you should be given the right to give your rebuttal if you go down a goal. I saw that in the MLS Cup yesterday to <laughs> grand effect, huh? <laughs> I mean, oh the goals kept coming in extra time. Oh, that game is the greatest MLS game I've ever seen, and for sure, the best MLS Cup final to date. Gareth Bale getting the tying goal near the end, as he so often does in big title games, and then one on PKs by LAFC. But here in the ACC, Duke hoping that it doesn't take that. Trying to protect their number one seed, undefeated record on the season. But needing a goal here. Amir Daly softly plays it forward to Scotty Taylor. Missed his pass to Shaq Mohammed. And that opens some space for the Tigers. And Scotty Taylor doing well to peel off the back line, getting a good cushion first touch. If he picks his head up, Shaq Muhammad was making a slashing run, a bit more patience. He could have flicked that around the corner, and Muhammad would have been in. Now here's Peter Stroud intercepting and starting the counter, but the pass broken up. He was looking for Muhammad down the channel on the right. Peter Stroud doing well, such a good reader of the game. When he breaks out, he had more time and space than he thought. Maybe taking it yourself. When the opposing team isn't putting any pressure on you, take the real estate they give you. Clemson, they were recovering, not really knowing what to do. A lot of players keeping an eye on Shaq Muhammad. Keep driving for Peter Stroud. Commit a defender, then make that final pass into Muhammad. 
And that is going to be a foul against Duke. And probably the most dangerous area where we've seen a free kick for either team so far tonight. Just outside of the area for Clemson now. Clemson doing a good job of winning. Second ball, something they did well in the first half. And that's a clear foul on Isaiah Reed, putting it through the legs a good, of good, good Bjornsson. Young defender getting caught flat-footed. Goes in a bit clumsy. Sets up golden opportunity for the Tigers. Good Bjornsson has been in and out of the lineup. He's been injured. The freshman from Iceland has had a tough first season, but now back here healthy for the postseason. And Duke will want to get this one right. Ten minutes deep, second half. Clemson looking to strike first as the number eight seed against number one Duke here. Keep an eye on how many Diop as well. He is a very potent and accurate set-piece taker. Chifamba blocked at the wall. And it will wind up as a goal kick. Not the best effort from Clemson, a more tamed approach. Now Duke beating Clemson in the semifinal round of this tournament a year ago and then losing to Notre Dame in the final. But as the number one seed here a year later, and the number one seed in this tournament for the first time since 2006 when they won it all. I remember that time very well. They beat my Wake Forest team in Deacons. That was not a pleasant memory, but a very good memory for the Blue Devils men's soccer program. Not so much personally. Now Duke also getting the victory over Wake Forest earlier this season. Beat them when they were number one. And for Duke, that was their first win over a number one ranked team in the nation in eight years. They beat them on the road in Winston-Salem by a 3-2 score. And interestingly enough, that was the last time Duke has conceded a goal. Gave up two in that game. But then it's been now over six games since. Six and a half games to be precise here since they've last let anyone find the back of their own net. And in that game against Wake, what I found interesting is it gave that believability that they could go and compete on the road. Some of their biggest wins this season have come against some of the toughest places to play in the ACC. Isaiah Reed waiting for the overlapping run. Cross eludes everyone. And now here's Ruben Masalas. This Clemson team, despite all of the obstacles they've had this season with the injuries, the illnesses, the COVID, losing players from last year, and players in and out of the lineup still they've been very productive with so much attacking talent that did come back collectively 30 goals on the year from 14 different players so the offense is not only skilled but it's deep and they tested duke early in this game but since then they haven't been, had many good looks at goal here since about the first quarter hour of this match and a player down for Clemson in the box. When you look through Wayne this Frederick Clemson here for Duke. And how many Diop down again? We've seen him on the ground in the first half. Not sure if he can continue. Hopefully he's okay. And Jai Bean coming in for Scotty Taylor. Meanwhile, for the Blue Devils with the clock stopped. Keep an eye on Diop. He's tracking towards the goal and didn't see much in that. Lost his footing, maybe there's something towards his lower body, but non-contact sort of incident. Hopefully he's okay. You never want to see one of your leaders in the back line go down with a non-contact injury. Hopefully the staff can get him sorted out and back on the game. 
Well, not just how many Diop, but also Wayne Frederick for Duke, who was on the far side waiting for that cross. He also kind of fell awkwardly as he turned his body. So one player for each team with no contact and really no other players around him kind of hobbling after that last sequence. Going on for the so Diop will come out. And we will remind you that the college basketball season tips off tomorrow. And we have you covered with ACC PM, which is in Chapel Hill from 3 to 5 Eastern, to get you primed for the Knights. And then we'll take you to Louisville as the number seven Cardinal women take on Cincinnati, followed by a men's doubleheader. You've got number seven Duke hosting Jacksonville right across the way from Koskinen Stadium here at Cameron Indoor. And then the number one ranked Tar Heels hosting UNC Wilmington just down the road in Chapel Hill. And then we wrap up the night with nothing but net. The crew is in Chapel Hill to tip off the season here on the ACC Network and the ESPN app. Now college basketball tipping off as college soccer heads down the home stretch into the postseason. The conference tournament finishing up the quarterfinal round here tonight and then the semifinals on Wednesday. Titus Sandy coming in for Hamidi Diop here. There's going to be big shoes for Sandy to fill. Never easy when you're a defender, especially a center back, coming in in a competitive game like this. You have to do the simple things well. Connect your first pass. Make your first tackle. That'll give you confidence to compete and contribute in a game like this. So as we close in on half an hour left to go in regulation, looking back, Clemson had those six shots in the first 20 minutes of the game back in the first half, but then just two in the last 38 plus minutes. It's been quite a reversal here. Overall, Clemson still out shooting Duke eight to four, but what has been the biggest difference in that regard in your mind, Michael, to the way things have changed? I think it's down to Duke figuring out some of the key players for Clemson to hone in on and be aggressive with Usman Silla in particular. Silla's gotten in dangerous positions at the top of the box, but how many Duke players have come back? Sometimes you've seen all 11 Duke players get behind the ball, recognizing that Silla is a very right-footed player and forcing him away from goal. You keep doing that, you're going to nullify a lot of attacks towards your goal. Seems like Duke has also been better and more resolute in the middle of the park as well. As we take a look back at that last foul. And a player who has been key to those midfield battles is Peter Stroud. I think him making runs out of midfield, driving this Duke team forward, is creating passing lanes and running lanes for the likes of Shaq Muhammad. 1v1 down the right. So Muhammad Say was waiting for it in the six-yard box, but it never made it through. Enrique Montana back for Isaiah Reed. Had to play a give and go, but didn't get the pass back from Chifamba. Here's Periano. Good defending from Periano. Shows the commitment of everyone on this Duke team. You have attackers getting back to double team. You're going to need to do that if you're going to quell the, this Clemson attack. Aaron Pass, though, picked up by Mohammed, but then he gives it away. And Amir Daly with an intervention late there that snuffed out that Clemson opportunity as we drop under half an hour remaining here in regulation time. Daly had to make that tackle. His opposite number was barreling in on goal, unchecked and unpressured. Typically, Daly will be going forward a lot. We'll see him down the flank, getting in offensive positions and attacking from that wingback position, the junior from Elmont, New York. But he's had more defensive responsibilities tonight and hasn't been able to get forward as much. It's down to the fact that Isaiah Reed is running a lot of his channels. Yeah. When you're a player who's used to getting forward, you're kept honest by the opposing attacker who pins you back. That's something they teach you. Isaiah Reed naturally an outside winger, left winger, right winger can play on either side, can use either foot. Daly's going to have to be smart about when he times his runs forward and breaks out of that back line. 
Stopping the clock for Adam Lindegaard, the redshirt freshman from Maryland, who was slow to get up here. Part of the youth national team setup, and also a guy who came through the D.C. United Academy. Probably the most consistent defender that Clemson has had this season in a year of inconsistencies. Mohamed Say battling Frederick. And then Say's own player hits him with the ball. That kind of night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the chippiness is only going to get higher. The emotions are going to keep sparking between Play these the two ball. teams. Good. Both teams committed towards competing. Now, not just this men's tournament happening on this November weekend, but also the ACC women's tournament wrapping up with number two Florida State winning their third consecutive title, beating number one North Carolina by a two to one score. The Seminoles keep rolling on when it comes to the postseason and women's soccer in the ACC. Yeah, congratulations to them. A dynasty forming in the state of Florida in women's soccer. And a week away from crowning their champion. That'll be next weekend after the semifinals midweek. We've got three of the four participants just waiting for the winner of this game. Virginia will be playing at Syracuse. And Wake Forest will either be on the road at Clemson or here at Duke. Mohammed overstepped that pass. Now Amir Daly for the Blue Devils. Good pass into the channel. Jai Bean on the turn. Looks for Mohammed. Goes to ground too easily. No call made. He popped right back up, probably knowing he wasn't going to get the call. Daly stepped into one. Mohammed shielding it with his body. Turning and looking for support. And the Tigers will escape here. And go long over the top where Hamill is well out of the 18 to head this one away. Good goalkeeping from Elliot Hamill, being aggressive off his line. Isaiah Reed, such a quick player. Reed was creating that separation with his speed. Hamill reading the danger and coming up with the header. Not quite midway through the second half here of this scoreless game. Last year's meeting between these teams in the semifinal round, so different than what we've seen tonight. Clemson outshot Duke 27 to four in that game and six to one in shots on target. Much different here tonight. Peter Chance Stroud. goes by the board for the Blue Devils here. Peter Stroud choosing the wrong option, doing well to make that lung busting run up the left side of the field, the box to box midfielder. <laughs> Covers so much ground for this Duke midfield. Had a teammate at the top of the box. Clemson's back line was looking for that cross. He puts too much on it and plays that ball out of bounds. And Mohamed Say coming out here. Getting a break. Perhaps taking a rest for a final run here at the end of regulation and maybe into overtime. That's another thing that the coaches have to think about that they didn't have to consider in the regular season. Rotations and keeping guys fresh during the 90 minutes in anticipation of the overtime period. That's where man management and knowing your players, knowing which players you can rely on to keep the momentum going and which players you need to give a rest to to be at their best and be key contributors in the final minutes of the game. So the coaches will have that figured out, the rotations and how they want to play it as Mike Noonan will have a few substitutions coming up here. But for the players, how much of a difference do you think it makes, Michael, to not having overtime in the regular season to now facing it in the postseason? It's a massive difference. Physically, your body's not used to it. When the 90 minutes are up, the game is done. Now this is where your fit players, your leaders on the team, that mental strength, that mental solitude, right here, that right mental here. resilience, excuse me, right that's where it's going to be paramount 
Which team has more of that? That fitness that you do in the offseason, during the season, that's going to be a big player in this second half and an extra time. This is Dylan Sullivan going wide with it. Elton Shafamba looks to cross. Line drive. And nobody could get ahead on it, but Clemson had a pair of players in the vicinity there. Good service, but Trimnell and the freshman from South Carolina who just came on to replace Mohamed Say couldn't connect. Keep an eye on this run from Trimdell. He curls his run in the Duke back line, not knowing what to do with him. Reacts quickest, curls that run between both defenders. They're caught flat-footed. No one jumps, and he'll want that one back. Did enough to create separation and should have put that on goal, maybe in the back of the net. Brandon Parrish also coming in. Avero Gomez going out. Shaq Mohamed from well out. Bouncing ball, and that's a fine save by Andema. That ball had some English on it. And anytime you get that skip in front of the keeper, you got to be careful, and he did well. In the last few minutes, we've seen Shaq Mohamed try his luck from distance. He puts his laces through that and gets a bit of bend on this wet surface at this stadium. That ball can go anywhere, maybe take a deflection. As I said in the first half, it's always good to test a young goalkeeper. And Dama up to the task, though. Does well to not to save it, but not give up a rebound. He's got six shutouts this season, working on another. His opposite number, Elliot Hamill, leading the country in shutouts with 11. A freshman here from Ghana against a grad student from Scarsdale, New York. Play the ball, play the ball. Marco Garcia, latest substitution, replacing Usman Silla who was very active in the early going, but has largely been quiet since about 20 minutes into that first half, and here especially in the second half as well. It's down to Duke and their midfield back pressing. Usman Silla does a good job of finding pockets of space off the shoulders of both defensive midfielders for Duke. But it's been a bit of taking too long of, to make a decision in the final third in the second half, and I think that's down to tired mind and tired body. Remember, it's only three days ago that they played a grueling game against Notre Dame. Oh, boy. I tell you what, Trimnell may have a case here. He's called for bumping good Bjornsson, who was trying to shield the ball and usher it out of bounds. And well, Trimnell has a right to go for the ball here, and maybe he just got that left arm up. If he gives him the shoulder, maybe he doesn't get the whistle. But that was close. I think that was a clear foul in the end. Correct call from the referee. He pushed him in the back. Another foul against Clemson here as we close in on the final 20 minutes. <laughs> All three of the previous games today in the quarterfinal round were decided in regulation, even though they were one goal games. Have not had overtime yet today. But getting closer here at Koskinen Stadium. But Clemson trying to prevent that, and they get the goal here late inside the final 20 minutes. Derek Wallop, the grad student from Wisconsin, breaks the Duke streak, and Clemson takes the 1-0 lead over the Blue Devils. And this is a goal that comes against the run of play for the Clemson Tigers. Indecision in Duke's back line leads to this golden opportunity for Clemson. Keep an eye on Isaiah Reed. He keep, keeps this play alive. His back to goal, the ball pinballs, and Wallop, that burst of acceleration, excellent first touch. Wrong foots. The onrushing Elliott Hamill, but when you're a midfielder and you have momentum, he goes against the grain and nothing Hamill could do about that. Too much power beats Hamill at his near post to give Clemson the lead. Wallop a goal leader. of the season for Derek Wallop. The grad transfer from Brown who led that team in points. All Ivy League first team player and his first goal here at Clemson. And what a time for it to give the Tigers the lead. 
And Locked ending up. that shutout streak of Elliott Hamble on this Duke defense. They had gone over six and a half games without conceding a goal. Finally give one up here with just inside of 20 minutes left to go in regulation of this quarterfinal game as the number one seed in the ACC tournament. Duke last year beating Clemson in the semifinals, and now Clemson trying to return the favor a year later in the quarters. That was a massive goal, no doubt about it. The timing of it, the way he took it, just a well-taken goal, takes that. The first touch, so aggressive, burst through a crowd of Duke defenders. And you only have a split second to make a decision. He gets off an excellent strike at that near post. And now it's up to Duke, a team that's been so good defensively this season to find the offense in the final third. Here's Amir Daly trying to get to the end line, blocked out for a corner. Off of Joey Skinner. Derek Wallace, the 15th different player this season to score for Clemson. And one of their biggest goals of the year. Credit to the impact of subs like Trimdell. He's been a spark plug for Clemson since coming on for Mohamed Say. Ruben Masalas on the corner, comes in. And off the head of Shaq Mohamed. Or excuse me, Jai Bean, I should say. Yeah, Jai Bean trying to glance that header at the near post, but doesn't execute the way he wants. And Duke all of a sudden finding themselves in an unfamiliar position. Been a long time since they have trailed. Something and a foul against both, the Tigers here. Something of note, both these teams have an amazing record when they take the lead and get that first goal. Clemson, very good away from home in particular. Trying to get to the semifinals of this tournament for the 19th time. And trying to beat Duke for what would be the fourth time here in this tournament as well. And a free kick for the Blue Devils. And Shaq Mohammed potentially wanted a card here, but none shown. Lundegaard coming in aggressively, and <laughs> that is a clear foul. He takes the wrong angle. It's good to gamble on that, but he didn't need to gamble. Shaq Mohammed had two players around him, wasn't going to go anywhere. Now another dangerous set-piece opportunity coming Duke's way. And Lundegaard cramping here. Kind of a dangerous defensive play. He's already sitting on a yellow, so a chance that he really didn't need to take. Potentially close to another yellow that would have sent him out of the game. But now after the yellow from earlier, just gets the common foul here. He's back on his feet after the cramp. And now Clemson trying to get the wall set here. Big free kick for Duke. Nick Periano, the right footer. Ruben Macellus, the left footer. Do you go for goal or do you try to find a runner and get a head ball? Absolutely try to find a runner. There's some tall players at the far post. It's Masalas. Good service. Just a little ahead of both Mohammed and Jai Bean. In the end, I think they get in each other's way. You have to vary your runs. Thought Shaq Mohammed had the cleanest look at this. Not the tallest player, but the one who reacts. And take it back, Jai Bean probably had the cleanest look. If he gets anything on that, and Dama was rooted to his line, we've seen that time and time again in this game. And Dama not as aggressive as we've seen in previous games, choosing to be more conservative. You get a touch on that, that ball redirects into the path of Shaq Muhammad. Elliot Hamill. Well out of the box, playing it long. Here's Periano settling it down, finding Bean. Go, go, go. 
Now Masalas taking on a couple of different defenders. Ruben Masalas spinning, has Parrish on him. And a throw in for the Blue Devils here with 16 minutes to go. Periano curls it in, or it's headed right back out. And now a transition opportunity for Clemson. Trying to hit on the counter with Isaiah Reed. He's got the wheels, and he's going to get there. Waiting for numbers in the box. Comes in, and on the short hop, Hamill takes it. I don't think that was the right decision from Isaiah Reed. He had dragged the center back all the way to the flank. A smarter decision would have been to keep possession, allow your entire team to get back and get numbers up in transition. Fortunately, Duke gives the ball away and Clemson are on the attack. And as I say that, it's a turnover game. And a whistle for Isaiah Reed, who is down here. Isaiah Reed, the senior from Rock Hill, South Carolina, last year was the most outstanding player on the offensive side at the College Cup. Scored both of Clemson's goals in the national championship game. Also scored in the ACC quarterfinal round against UNC last year as well. Has been injured for a portion of this season and has really had to battle to stay in the lineup. But coming off that terrific run in the postseason last year where he was the most outstanding player and really was so instrumental in helping Clemson win the national title. Now Derek Wallace has the only goal here tonight. Let's look back once again at how he got it done. Timing is everything. When you're a midfielder, it's picking your moments. Duke does not do well. That ball pinballs. Look at that first touch, though, from Wallaf. It separates him from the rest of the pack. And then he catches Elliott Hamill at the near post. Too much sauce, too much pace on the shot to give Clemson the 1 0 lead. Just over a quarter of an hour left to go. Duke trailing for the first time since October the 1st. So over a full month since they've been behind, trying to come back. And well, on October the 1st, when they were trailing at Wake, they were able to overcome the deficit. And they beat the Demon Deacons, who were number one in the nation at that time, by a 3-2 to two score on the road in Winston-Salem. Tonight, they're at home, stakes higher here in the quarterfinals of the ACC tournament with 15 minutes to go trailing by one to number eight Clemson. In that game against Wake they did it behind the goals of Jai Bean and Shaq Muhammad. They're going to need those two to step it up and be clinical in the final third if they're going to get anything out of this game. Who's Silla back in for Clemson leading this team in goals and points with Five and 16 respectively this season. Quiet second half from him so far. And that's going to be a foul on Good Bjordson. Physical play from Good Bjornsson. That's Garcia getting the brunt of that one. With Deuce Montella coming back in, rested for some time. He will be key in transition moments. Isaiah Reed out. Silla's ability to win second balls, pick up ahead of steam, and be dynamic on the counterattack is something to keep an eye on. Sub, 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 sub. And a substitution right, coming up here. Just before the Clemson throw it. So that'll be Alvaro Gomez, the senior from Spain, coming back in for Marco Garcia. Gomez, one of the starters at the beginning of the match. A lot at stake for the Blue Devils. Uh, Berth in the semifinals of the ACC tournament as well as trying to keep their unbeaten season alive. First time they've gone undefeated in the regular season since 1999. 11-0-4 overall on the year. 7-0-3 here at home, but unless they get a goal, they will suffer their first defeat of the year. And for Duke, it would be their first loss since 
losing to St. Louis in the NCAA tournament a year ago. They lost to SLU in their second game of the tournament last year. And have not lost since. But number one is down one nothing. Will it be our fourth consecutive one nothing game here on quarterfinal Sunday in the ACC tournament? Wake Forest won by a one nothing score. So did UVA and so did Syracuse. Clemson leading here with the corner. Headed up into the air, and Hamill is there. Mohamed Say should have done better with that one. Uncontested header at the far post. Doesn't get enough contact on it, and a tame effort into the hands of Hamill. When this ball hangs up in the air, Hamill off his line. Keep an eye, I think it's Periano who hesitates. You cannot do that in a game of this magnitude. The Blue Devils let off the hook. Here's Chafamba. For Silla. Usman Silla. And Hamill is there once again. Now Duke's the team that needs the goal, but Clemson has been strong on the ball here. Not sitting back in a block. Just playing defense. They've been going forward and looking for more. It's very much... The Clemson Tiger way, they're a team that when they get one, they score goals in bunches. Given how they've been scoring goals at free will, again, three goals in their last three games each. So they will be feeling confident about their chances of getting the next goal. Under 11 minutes now left to go. The last time that the number one overall seed in the ACC tournament lost in the quarterfinal round, it was six years ago when number eight Boston College beat number one North Carolina. And right now it's number eight Clemson leading number one Duke. Amir Daly. Now good Bjornsson. Ruben Masalas. With 10 minutes left to go. Peter Stroud on the turn. Now Shaq Mohammed. Crossed by Daly. The header blocked. And finally cleared. That's a good now block daylight from, for Clemson. It's a good block from the Tigers. Scotty Taylor getting his head around it. Diving headed effort. It's much better from Duke getting numbers in the box. Three, four players. Desperation hour approaching him. Masalas on the move. Needs support. Now Periano. Daly making the run. Good sliding effort to get there. Mohammed on the turn. Shaq Mohammed. Shot well off the target there. He was dragging it all the way. But kept in though. On the far side by Masalas. That ball was curling along the end line. Now Masalas 1v1 for Amir Daly. Periano on the turn. He's got the footwork wrong. And Duke resets with nine minutes to go. Needing a goal. Masalas will win the corner kick for Duke. Patient buildup from Duke, trying to find the key that's going to unlock this stubborn Clemson back line. It's Nick Periano. With eight and a half to go, the in-swinger on the corner for Duke. Again, a Blue Devil team very good on set pieces. Good delivery here, but the header is out of the box. And then a bouncing ball well wide for a goal kick. Disappointing effort. The likelihood of scoring a goal from that distance is very low. The better play would have been to recycle the pass and maybe feed it out wide. There's a better angled service that Duke has, especially given the number of players they have in the box.
Well, ACC PM with Mark Packer, Trey Boston, and Taylor Tannenbaum. They'll be talking football, but we'll also have the latest from around the conference weekdays at 4 Eastern. That's right here on the ACC Network and the ESPN app. Seven and a half to go. Last year, it was Duke beating Clemson on the road in the semifinal round. And now a year later, it's Clemson trying to beat Duke in the quarters here on the road themselves. Wallop the goal score. Just wallops it down to Elliott Hamill. Finds Masalis against Brandon Parrish. Was taken aim at Scotty Taylor and cleared out by the Tigers. Anything else if you're Duke, you try that you haven't already. Any other ways to potentially probe for that equalizer? Maybe a formation shift. Duke has been playing a 4-4-2 for much of this game. Maybe shifting to a 3-5-2, getting an extra body in midfield. Here's Shaq Mohammed. It was deflected. Desperation appeal for handball, really not close. Shaq Mohammed using great skill to unbalance this Clemson team, and I think it was incidental contact. If anything, that ball went off his thigh, may have glanced off his arm, but incidental contact. Peter Stroud driving forward. Gets the crossover. And Ruben Masalas has body in an awkward position. Really couldn't get anything on it as we drop south of six minutes to go. Here's Mohamed Say. He can use that size and physicality here to just hold on to it, but and rolls out for a throw. Well, that's good work for Mohamed Say. You chew up a couple seconds off the clock, but more importantly, you force. Duke's back line to run 70, 80 yards back towards your own goal. Every second counts, but those yards that you make the opponent use to chase the ball down in their own end, they matter. And give it away. Here is Susman Silla for Mohamed Say. Content to work on the clock here with five minutes to go. Duke. So far, undefeated this year. Their last home loss to an ACC opponent, interestingly enough, was also Clemson. It was last October when the 23rd ranked Tigers won in overtime over these Blue Devils here at Koskinen Stadium. Tonight, the stakes much different. And with five minutes left to go, substitutions for the Tigers here. Isaiah Reed coming back on. I think it's good man management from coach Mike Noonan. On the goal, you have Mohamed Say on the bench. And a lot of your key players aren't even on the field. And the impact of the subs have to be applauded. There is Silla. I was looking for Reed, who had some space. Well, if this score holds, Duke will be the only one of the top four seeds to have lost here today in the quarterfinal round. All of the better seeds have already won two, three, and four, advancing to the semifinal round. Duke is number one, but they're trailing by one. Four and a half to go. Shaq Mohammed has two defenders chasing. Daly on the cross, comes through dangerously. Kept in by Masalas now. Flipped in for Shaq Mohammed. Mohamed trying to turn and find some space. Lofts it up for Periano. His header is blocked. Just couldn't get much behind that one. And now we're down to the final four minutes. Duke creating some opportunities here. That last cross a few moments ago that came across the six-yard box. Boy, that was tantalizing. Nobody could get a body on it, though. Amir Daly loses possession here. Joey Skinner venturing forward, and he's fouled by Peter Stroud. Credit to Clemson's back line. You have countless players throwing their bodies, blocking shots, 
winning tackles. It's the little details and winning things in the midfield, the midfield battle that make the difference. Peter Stroud's lunging effort, just half a second late. Credit to Skinner, though, by getting that extra touch using those long legs to create the advantage. Mike Noonan appealing the clock had stopped, but restarted here. Counting down towards three minutes left to go. Axel! 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 And now they'll stop the clock here as some gamesmanship taking place. As we look back at that chance a moment ago, Amir Daly on the cross. That's good first time cross from Daly. Good recognition of where the vulnerabilities were for Clemson. And keep an eye on Periano. That's so unfortunate. That ball was headed towards goal. Maybe not the power he would have wanted, but the right technique to head that down into the ground. The Tigers doing well to block shots, getting everyone behind the ball. One thing for Duke, not enough players in the box still. Periano and Stroud, the only other players aside from Taylor in the box when that ball gets wide for the cross from Shaq Muhammad. Our Let's see more Kevin gambling. Morrison, Kevin Morrison over at the monitor here. Don't exactly know what he's checking out. I don't know if this is a clock issue or something else. And we're told that it's a issue where he's just checking to see how much time it run off. So try to see exactly where to set the clock here. That's what head coach Mike Noonan of Clemson was talking about. He was discussing how the clock had stopped with the referee Kevin Morrison and through the sequence of events that eventually led to another stoppage that's when Morrison decided to come over and figure out exactly how much time needed to be displayed he didn't, I don't know. is the clock now correct or not he didn't, uh, Kevin No, we're not adding. We're not adding time. It's, was it was 303? No, no. So on the foul, did the clock continue to run or stop? No, it stopped, so we need to take some time. All right, so, so play it from there. Oh. Well, let's see if we can figure out exactly where they might land here when it comes to where the clock should be. This foul happens from Peter Stroud. There's what, 336 left on that. And the clock stops at 335. And the clock had stopped, then it was started again. Mike Noonan's contention was that it should have kept running. One thing of note, given these breaks that you don't account for, if you're the team chasing the game, you don't want these sort of disruptions because it kills your momentum. It allows the team defending to get refreshed. And if you're Clemson, you'll take this moment we need to take off of to regroup and, and really seconds. let your legs get back underneath you for one final uh -huh. push to defend. Yeah. Yeah, because, because the now this is a team that played just a few days ago, so fatigue would certainly affect them more than Duke, you would think. And this is a nice break to have here when you're trying to see the game out. Five seconds less. Okay, thank you. All right. Yes, it is. Should read 257. It's not right. Five seconds off. It's 17 seconds. You just said 17 seconds. That's what you just said, 17 seconds, and you took five seconds off. You've got, you got to be shitting me. You've got to be shitting me. Well, 
I think you can infer that Mike Noonan is not altogether satisfied with how this has turned out. But he might be satisfied with the way this game turns out here because there's under three minutes to go. He has the one nothing lead. And Duke now with Hamill slipping. But they're able to recover with Miguel Ramirez clearing it away. Almost costly oh moment from Elliot Hamill. A bit too over-eager. What a bad time to lose your footing. Because not only do you lose possession, but it ticks off precious seconds from the clock. Seconds you desperately need to keep the, your ACC tournament hopes alive. Now Duke needs to get on the ball here. Mohamed Say pulls it down. Amir Daly comes in, physically works him off the ball, but then loses possession. It comes back to Say. They've got a two-on-one. Here's Silla. Now Say. And Mohamed Say keeps it in. Back for Silla. Slide tackle by Stroud. Pops back up. Clemson doing a terrific job just killing off this clock. Duke needs to get on the ball, but instead they concede the throw in. And the clock now stopped with a minute 45 left to go. That is not the sequence that Duke wanted. And Mohamed Say is down. You can see the frustration from Shaq Mohamed, and it starts from that play and that decision from the veteran goalkeeper, Elliot Hamill. So uncharacteristic of him to fumble on that play, lose his footing, and a melee ensues. So much commotion, Clemson, the recognition, then it goes back to the experience. When you have players who have played in big games, Mohamed Say and Usman Silla doing well, this 50-50 challenge. Well, that may have been a foul, Mohamed Say nudging the defender from behind, but keep an eye on Usman Silla. The recognition of there's not enough numbers in the box to keep the play alive and pirouette out. That's what makes Clemson such a successful team, is recognizing the moments and what the game needs. Now Duke just needs to get on the ball here. Going to be a goal kick. A minute and a half left to go. Duke's unbeaten season now hanging in the balance. Headed back ahead. Mohamed Say here. On the turn, in the box, waits for support. No need to hurry. Usman Silla, content to kill time, and how did he miss that? Now Brandon Parrish, with just north of a minute left to go. Terrific opportunity for Dylan Sullivan a moment ago. Now here's Parrish carrying the ball in and finishing off number one, Duke, with a minute left to go. Brandon Parrish with a moment of brilliance, individual skill, magic in his boots, and surely it's game, set, match, Clemson Tigers. You see what it means to him, his team, and the fans in attendance. And this ball cannons off the crossbar. A lot of players, Duke players, with their head down and taking a playoff, but keep an eye on Parrish. Slaloms through. Countless Duke defenders, and when Hamill comes out of his goal, he should have stayed in. And Parrish, the composure to get by Hamill. That is just world-class dribbling and a world-class goal to cap off a heck of a performance from the Clemson Tigers. Now for Brandon Parrish, the junior from Nashville, Tennessee. A Gatorade Player of the Year in high school in Tennessee, a high school All-American. Now the third goal of his career, second this season, and the Duke fans on their way out of Koskinen Stadium. The Blue Devils trailing 2-0. And the number one seeded team in the ACC tournament is set to go out in their first game. A team that was unbeaten on the year coming in. The number one seeded team in this tournament, number one overall seed, number three team in the country, having gone six straight games without conceding a goal, and now they've given up two here as we work our way towards the end.
And Clemson leading by a 2-0 score. Now this number eight seeded Clemson team, Michael, not playing like a number eight seed here late in the season. And you really see the big game experience of these key Clemson players through the spine of the team. It really showed today a mature performance from the Tigers, well coached by head coach Mike Newton. And it was the unsung heroes. They came up with the big goals. They're going to need.